And our next panel is Protecting Our Culture, Diversity, Locality, Cooperism, with Mark Lawrence moderating it. It's me again. I didn't go far. Um, so before we start, I think follow, follow the same trend from the last panel. If we could just do some introductions on, on who you are and what you do. I think we're on. You're all good. Over to you. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Takako Fujiyama, I'm from Pioneer DJ Japan, and I'm in charge of uh, Asia Pacific Sales and Marketing now. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Rob Spitzer from AG Presents. Um, we're involved in live entertainment across Asia, so that's concerts and tours, uh, festivals, um, sport, sport events, um, and some content business. Jason Swamy recently took on a new role with NetEase Cloud Music. Um, I think you just heard Jesse. It's the largest electronic music streaming platform in China. My other projects include Wonder Fruit in Thailand, uh, Robot Heart, Burning Man, uh, Further Future in the US, and a uh, uh, recent deal with Coalition Entertainment for Talent Buying in the region as well. Hi, my name is Christian. Um, from Ismail. I'm the founder of Ismaya Group. We're based in Indonesia, and we do um, festivals and concerts and um, venues, establishment around Indonesia. Hi, my name is Arsit. Um, I'm based in Thailand. Um, our company, HG Productions, produces festivals in Thailand and Myanmar. Brilliant, thank you. So um, maybe we'll just start with you as well. Could you deep dive a little bit into your, into your company? Tell me how long it's been around, how many events, just give us a flavor of the expanse of, of your company. Uh, company has been around for 15 years. Um, we started kind of small when I came back from the States, mainly doing club shows. Um, we launched our first festival eight years ago. Uh, we now have three in the market um, in Thailand and two in Myanmar. Um, we also do obviously one international brand, which is uh, Ultra. Uh, my company started four year 14 years ago. It started from uh, uh, clubs and bars and restaurants. We have 60 of them now. Uh, we also do festivals, um, four or five a year. Uh, two of the biggest ones are Jakarta Warehouse Project, which is 90,000 people last year, and We The Fest, which is 50,000 people last year. And we also do ultra, and we also do concerts, like One Direction, Katy Perry, and stuff. I've uh, been in business for 18 years. Um, started in the US, uh, moved back to Hong Kong where I'm from eight years ago, saw there was a big void in, in quality music, so started my passion for electronic music again, and then this started to be a growing opportunity um, throughout the region, started servicing the region, and then uh, from there moved into produce, helping produce a festival and start a festival in Thailand, sustainability, eco-friendly uh, festival called Wonderfruit, which now it's in its fourth year this December. Um, I recently took on this role with Netty's Cloud Music because obviously we all see the opportunity in China, but what, what fascinated me most was um, the access to data and what that data could do in terms of making great decisions for talent buying, spotting talent, and you know, a lot of the issues we're gonna be discussing today about supporting local talent and how can we um, facilitate the market in a, fair, in a more fair manner. So that really <clears throat> gravitated me, me towards to that particular role. So we're looking forward to uh, revealing quite a, a lot of new plans in Q4. I can give you a little more, a little more background on AEG. Uh, globally, um, the company's well known for venues like the O2 in London or the Staples Center in LA. We've got venues uh, pretty much all over the world, including uh, here in Shanghai at the Mercedes-Benz Arena. Um, we also have a, a big live entertainment component for touring. Um, and festivals, if you've heard of Coachella or uh, Hyde Park in London. So we've got festivals uh, in most markets, um, although in Asia it's a, it's a new area for us. Um, on the touring side, um, lots of big artists touring around the world, uh, including Asia. Um, this year our highlights are Ed Sheeran um, and Metallica earlier in the year. And we had Justin Bieber, but he won't be making it. Um, and uh, our region for Asia actually spans from Japan all the way over to Dubai and down to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, for uh, DJ business, Pioneer started like, uh, this is our 23rd year, and uh, well, Europe and US is a major country, but, um, and we started for the, what we're 
we have started the speaker business as well, uh, like th three years ago. And two years ago, we just launched a, a music production product. So we keep on going, uh, producing new business and in including Asia area. Um, one of the observations that's been made at, at conferences before, particularly outside of European and American conferences, is the experience faced by India, which had a, a, a nice, cool, small, but perfectly formed underground scene 10 years ago. And then as the EDM rush kind of appeared and the bigger festivals came in and the large agencies and promoters supersized the Indian scene, without leaving an infrastructure behind, what happened was that the big DJs came in, the big agents and the big DJs got the money, and then as tastes moved on and as, as the culture clash began to emerge between Indian government and the scene, not a lot was left behind. And, and I'm keen to sort of build on what we talked about in the last panel, about how we balance local talent, local culture, importantly, and, and an emerging electronic music scene. So I'm, I'll say I'm interested to understand how you balance some of the, the religious and cultural aspects with some of the, you know, kind of the brashness of electronic music and how those challenges can emerge, particularly in the live scene. Um, I don't think the religious aspect is much of a factor. Um, I think that, as for Thailand at least, in terms of the underground, um, eight, nine, ten years ago, you could fill a room with a thousand people, with Sasha or whoever. Today, if you can do 300, you can, you'd be considered lucky. Um, I think with EDM uh, coming in and expanding very quickly, um, I think people's, people's tastes are gonna mature down the road, but I think it's all about timing. Um, there's also a lack of venues. At, at the end of the day, 95% um, of the clubs in Thailand are playing EDM. Um, just in Bangkok, I would say there's two dedicated underground um, nightclubs which have a capacity of 250 people. So when certain artists come over and they have a very high profile, you know, you, it's, it's all about balance at the end of the day. It's tough to put a 15,000 euro DJ in a 200 cap room and walk away even breaking even, if that. So it goes back to, you know, sponsors and all that. So, you know, we are very uh, heavily uh, sponsorship base um, when it comes to uh, certain events. So, you know, without them, it can't happen. It's really that simple. And Christian, how important is brand and sponsorship to your business? And, and does that enable the underground to thrive or does that focus you towards a commercial sound and commercial artists? Uh, in our market, I think sponsorship and brands partnership is critical. You know, um, if you see the ticket pricing in Indonesia, uh, because the income per capita is quite low, so we need to price our tickets aggressively. And without our partnership and sponsorship, there's no way we can afford the talents that we need to, you know, to bring in, to pull the crowd. And it works for the mainstream market, commercial market, because the brands knows who they are, right? But for, it's, our, it's always our challenge to bring the brands closer to the underground talents, you know, so they know the story behind, you know, it's our, our job to educate them. So what we usually do is we start integrating the brand in the smaller events uh, one by one until, you know, in the, until they grow into the festival level. Uh, for example, we just did uh, in Bali, part of Ultra, we also do the resistance. Uh, uh, one, one day, like, uh, featuring Carl Cox, Sasha Dickwit and everything. That wouldn't happen if we don't have a local partnership with the, with the brands, you know. And even for those lineup, you know, uh, even if we sold out, we're not going to make money. We're still going to lose a lot of money. So that's why it's critical to be close to the brand and tell them, okay, this is what's happening now, but you know, you need to invest a little bit more into the long term and the future, and that's what we're trying to do. And Jason, I'm interested in your perspective as well. Do you, do you think that the boom in electronic music in Asia is reflecting all of the flavors of Asian countries and cultures or do you think it's at risk of importing American culture and, and EDM? Well, I think in its current state, there's definitely cultural imperialism. Uh, we're at the top of the pyramid in terms of kind of uh, the learning curve. And with that happening, it's usually going to come from top down because there's no indigenous market for, for EDM. EDM and it's, uh, for, for indigenous market, there, there has to be scale. 
And when it first starts off, there isn't scale, there isn't the know-how, there isn't the skill set along the value chain to develop this product. So what do you do? You gravitate to, a, to, to something you're familiar with. Okay, the Ultra name. They have benchmarks. They have best practices. So once that comes in and then people understand the formula and they, and they learn it, then you start having um, people, st you start developing local promoters who are willing to take risks. Then you have the infrastructure of, of eyeballs where brands want to go, okay, well, I'm, I see that this is potential. I want to contribute some money. And, and, and local promoters such as these two gentlemen here themselves are able to develop, um, you know, the, the information that, that sponsors are, are, are looking to do for, to get their ROI. Um, and it all needs to be aligned in order for that to happen. But, you know, it's a necessary evil to bring in foreign brands. But then over time, there's nothing that Asia uh, cannot do that the West can do, if not more. I mean, when you look at it from, as the, as the business evolves, you know, looking at a U and a bunch of fireworks is not going to be that interesting anymore. And what's going to happen is when you look around the Asia landscape and you have beautiful castles in Rajasthan, you look at Indonesia, in Bali, you have amazing, you know, sites. That's going to be much more compelling for, for people spending money to be in an experience as opposed to a manufactured, you know, bells and whistles. So I think we have a very strong advantage as time goes on. Yeah. Because we're drawing from rich culture. And, and AEG being an enormous global company, how do, you, how do you keep your eye on the emergence of local talent and local events? To, and at what point would you switch to start blending international talent with local talent? I would, I would say that, that combination for us will come best in the, in the festival space. Um, you know, like, like these guys have said, you know, the, the brands are very important, but we certainly don't let them choose the artists. Um, I think that, you know, the important thing is to have the right curator. Um, all of the festival events that my international colleagues work very hard on uh, maintain their own identity. Um, and we haven't thought to, you know, take something from overseas and transplant it uh, or, or, you know, replicate it widely. Um, while I know that can work uh, and, there, you know, there might be a model for that, um, I think when you look at our portfolio, it's really about unique uh, events that are, that are tied to the place where they are, as Jason was talking about, whether, whether the landscape, you know, Coachella only works at the, you know, Indio Valley of, of Coachella, you know, in, in California. Um, you wouldn't take that and put it in an urban Asian setting just because it's a famous brand. Um, so I think what's really important is to develop the kinds of events that that makes sense both in terms of scope and scale in, in a particular market. So for us, what we're busy looking at and exploring are opportunities to work you know, in various Asian markets on events that, that really fit that place. And that's where you can mix international talent that's coming in and drawing you know, a certain audience with opportunities for up and coming artists, um, you know, vanguard artists from that particular locale or somewhere nearby. And I think that's what's important is to, is to curate the right mix so that, you know, you're bringing in what's going to be commercially successful, but you're then maintaining an identity and maintaining an edge. And you, know, you talk to the people who program festivals, they don't want to just do, you know, a copycat of what somebody else did down the road. They want to have their own event, you know, unique to that place. Uh, and Takaka, I think the, the word, the phrase that, we came, that came out of the last panel was, was developing local heroes which I'm hoping becomes a theme for the conference, actually. And Pioneer is always, I guess, associated with big international DJs and, you know, becomes the standard DJ setup. To what extent is Pioneer looking underneath that and going into Taiwan and Hong Kong and Indonesia and working with local talent to make local heroes? Yeah. Yeah, as we discussed last year. Um, well, not only Japan, but I was visiting all these Asian countries within these two months. And everyone was like, uh, they have a really talented DJs all over the world, and they are their influencers. But yeah, unfortunately, like DJ is not that much what it's not that popular yet. And even like DJing, they have to have a, a second business or something. So what we want to do is again, of course, uh, I want to grow this Asian market. So use this kind of um, I'm trying Japan first, but uh, you you uh, have those talented DJs to not only, uh, what I want to focus them in our, what not, not using our brand, but the, these 
promote the, their talents, not the big names, but so it may take time, but I'm thinking like, of course, if they play at those festivals, the international DJs are very important. But at the other hand, I want those local DJs to also participate a lot in those festivals. That's what I'm trying to what, talk with these uh, partners as well. Mm. Um, Arsik, can, can you run your business with local heroes? And, and uh, I think we all agree that you have to start bringing the local heroes through. What, uh, how, what percentage of your lineup or of your artists currently do you think is local? And how are you going to set about increasing that percentage, if indeed you are? That's a tough one. Um, I mean, it always starts with the locals, but we're also developing um, local artists. Um, actually, there's a duo from Myanmar called Terra Base that just produced a song with Lil Jon. Um, that's on the more commercial front. And, um, you know, in terms of the underground, there's Sanju Hargan who's produced and, uh, for Tiga and a few other labels. But when it comes to lineups, I think that you've got to give them that fair share and try to, if, if the international artists agree, we try to squeeze them in between, but usually it's not the case, but we'll try it. Um, but we, we, we try to put out on as much as possible, you know, on all our lineups. And, and is, Christian, is that reflected in your business as well, that, that it's, it's challenging economically to bring the local artists through, but something that you try to do? Or is, do you have to think top line first, bottom line next, you know, sell tickets first and develop talent later? No, I think it's a good balance, you know, because, you know, because I'm from Indonesia, so it's also my passion to, you know, push Indonesian uh, artists forward, young talents. And Indonesia has 20, 250 million people. And six, I think a lot of them are still young and, you know, passionate and creative. So we do find a lot of local talent that have potential. And what we do is we book about, I think about 50% of our lineup is local talents. And a lot of them are actually have, just need the opportunities, you know. And, you know, uh, I don't know if you hear, but this one Indonesian uh, kid who are actually breaking through worldwide called Rich Shiga, you know, who is actually from a neighborhood, a neighborhood our neighborhood, you know. So he would be a good icon for the young people to try to be the same, you know. So I think it's our job as a platform to push the local talents. We try to put 50% on the talents. And some, now when we book the headliners international, we ask them also to do collaboration with local talents. And we work with the media, with the radio, and the PR. So hopefully, you know, both, both the local talents and the international talents can actually pull crowd in the future. Jason, to what extent do you, do you think that we can almost move the other way and begin to export some of the rich culture of all of the Asian countries that make up the Asian market out to Europe and out to America and almost flip it the other way? Yeah, I don't think we're too far from it, to be honest. I mean, with our project with Wonderfruit, I mean, we're consistently rated as one of the most beautiful festivals in the world, progressive festivals in the world. Um, you know, you, we have a cryptocurrency that's tied to mangroves where... Um, you know, we're paying artists with tr mangrove trees. We, we, build, uh, we build stages made out of rice, and then we feed the poor with them. Um, so it's very innovative, very progressive. Um, when you look at a lot of the transformational festivals, which is the evolution of these EDM festivals, such as um, Lightning in a Bottle, Burning Man, a lot of the ethos, and these are ethos and principles-driven festivals, a lot of these sentiments are driven from Eastern culture. I mean, uh, or hippie culture. And hippie culture started from the 70s, but a lot of it comes from Eastern values anyway. And as people get bored of the mundane and the, um, and the homogeny that's, that's starting to set in in the EDM world, they're looking for more content and richer content. And uh, people are also looking to jump on planes to experience more. So I, I don't think we're too far from it. And, and part of the reason why I did join uh, Nettie's Cloud Music and be a partner was that we're able to spot talent, um, local talent, and we're able to, and I want to help co-develop them and manage them to bring them back to the West. Because there's nothing that, I mean, electronic music has no face, right? I mean, you, your list, the music, it, it speaks for itself. Um, unless you're a performer, then performing is a big element. But the music itself has no face. It's good music, you either like it or you don't. So, you know, give an example. We were... Um, we've red flagged some data uh, for, for, for listening patterns and we've discovered talent in Vietnam where there's 
11 million fan base with, hun with hundreds of millions of plays. And we went to visit this kid in uh, Vietnam, in Saigon, and no he doesn't know he's famous, right? And, and the funny thing is he has 27 tracks on this. And I'm like, well, if he's 19 years old, if we could cultivate this guy to be a superstar and send him back to the US. And we've actually got him, I, I talked to Storm and got him a couple of slots, but would you rather pay $1.5 million for Calvin Harris and see if you get an ROI, or would you rather pay $1,000 to this hungry kid who wants to play, who has the same size fan base in a particular market? So it's kind of an easy question. So for me, I, I'm really excited with that, that aspect of it. Uh, and Rob, for, from an AEG perspective, what would the trigger be from a commercial business decision to start importing Asian talent into the US market? Is there a point you go, something's happening, now we need to make a decision or a change? We, we can't start because we're already doing it. Uh, we do a lot of it. Um, I mean, that's the thing is, I, I wonder if, Perhaps if, if you know, people in the, in the Asian industry or, or seen um, are really aware of how much talent does get exported. Um, not to say that we do all of it, but we've been involved in tours with Chinese artists. Um, there have been you know, plenty of Japanese acts that tour. Um, the Koreans lately have been going you know, far and wide. I mean, we've got, um, I think, BTS in like nine markets across North America and they go down to South America. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty broad. I, I actually didn't even realize the full extent of it. You realize like how much Korean talent goes to Europe uh, and plays, you know, in those markets. Uh, and it's obviously, it's not that they have, you know, strong uh, Korean fan bases in those places. These are local fans in Europe, South America, North America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and of course across Asia that, that are consuming that music. So it's happening now. I think it's probably, you know, important for those of us in the Asian music scene to pay attention to what's working. Um, and I think now that you've seen so much from Northeast Asia, I think probably Southeast Asia is on its way. And there's really nothing stopping, you know, um, uh, an up-and-coming talent from, from really any of these markets, you know, to, to breaking through. It's just going to take that, that spark. And if you <laughs> want to know what that spark is, I mean, for them to go and play, it's going it to have to be commercially viable. Um, now, obviously, it depends on what scale. So if they're willing to make, you know, like you said, if they're willing to make the trip, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for on becoming artists that probably didn't exist a few years ago. And Takaka, how, how important do you think it is to celebrate the unique cultures of all of the Asian territories within the global family of electronic music? And, and how often do you think it is celebrated? How often yeah. it's celebrated? Oh, actually, I haven't. Not, but I the answer is not clear. enough. My perspective would be uh -huh. that everyone looks at every, that yeah. just sees a global market that's yeah. very westernized uh -huh. and, yeah. and there's, not, there's not enough being done to push up. Uh, okay. Well, I think, well, well, it's a quite difficult question. <laughs> Sorry, very answer. difficult one. Yeah. Well, okay, well, let's look at, in that case, let's just look at Pioneer specifically. So you, you're working with, with increasingly more local DJs. How, how will you move them to the next level so they're seen globally? Actually, what, what we are trying to do is, um, well, uh, have them, how should I say? Uh, we also want to support them. So what we are trying to do is like, for using our promotion video, uh, we used to use those Western DJs, international superstars in the, in the past, but now we're trying to um, support them, those Japan, Korean DJs utilizing for our marketing uh, videos as well. And we're starting, maybe this is first step, but this one we want to increase this and to make it like a global, yeah, uh, to make this globe, uh, put in those Asian talents in this global industry. Yeah. yeah, and the great thing about taking baby steps in today's yeah, world right. is they very quickly turn into grown-up yeah. steps because, because everyone can see everything immediately. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, from your perspective, and looking at your events, are they designed for a local market, or are you increasingly seeing international attendance at your events? I think it's a bit of both. When it first started, it was more commercialized, uh, more localized. Um, but through the years, obviously, we're building traction in the market with our brands, there, we've seen quite an increase with people flying in from neighboring countries. Um, whether it's Singapore, Malaysia, it goes as far as Hong Kong, Taipei. Um, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been 
pretty positive in the past, I would say, three years. So if a young kid from Denver got on a plane and came to one of your events, would they recognize something that they were familiar with in the US, or would they feel they were walking into something unique? Well, I hope they would, but, you know, um, I guess that goes with time, and uh, there's also, you know, that difference in culture, you know. I mean, most of the events that are done in Thailand, due to several factors and zoning laws, um, are usually indoor. So we don't really have that outdoor experience in the middle of Bangkok, um, and that's due to several factors. But I think that, you know, you can kind of relate to what's going on, uh, you know, essentially. That's a really good point. How, to what extent do local factors and local culture, Christian, inhibit you from developing events to the, the scale or the size or the manner in which you would want them to? Do you have barriers? There's not really a said barrier, let's put it that way. But An unsaid barrier. Um, I think that, you know, due to, you know, the demographics in the city, it's just not designed to, to have a 30,000 capacity outdoor event. Um, whether it's the zoning, whatever, there's a lot of factors. I mean, Thailand, just the traffic alone to get from point A to point B, take you 90 minutes, you know? If you had a 30,000 capacity, you might as well have to leave at like 8 a.m. to get there in the right time. But um, I think that um, overall, um, I don't think it's very difficult, but I think that international brands need to understand that the experience that they're trying to sell in each of the respective markets have to be different because you know whether it's an ultra or whatever it is you can't you can't have something like at Bayfront Park in 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 Thailand or you know whether it's Jakarta and you know that's where it goes back into more of the indoor um, you know venues Christian same question for yeah, you I just want to add that I think especially in Indonesia and probably Malaysia because we are a Muslim dominated country the barrier is quite high to be, to be honest to produce uh, high, a large-scale electronic music events. Number one is because general connotation of you know the industry is you know uh, sorry to say a lot of drugs, alcohol, you know, and stuff like that, which is not good in a Muslim-dominated country. But I guess that's where the work has to be done as a, a good promoter and people who produce the music, uh, the, the the festivals and the events that you have to be able to overcome those challenges. But it's not easy. Uh, it takes time for anybody, even for us, to be able to produce uh, what we produce in terms of scale. Um, and it's true, it's actually really expensive to produce, to overcome those barriers, you know, but we have to do what we have to do to make sure the foundation is, is there. And, and Jason, what, what barriers do you think exist to exporting the, sort of the rich culture of, of Asian events and Asian artists into the Western world, and equally, what barriers prevent Asian events getting an international audience to come and participate? That's a difficult one, but I mean, for the first part, I think, uh, what, because it, I'll use the American market as an example, because I'm, I'm much more familiar with that than the European market. I mean, Americans tend to be very politically correct. So with that brings a lot of issues of cultural appropriation. So let's say you have people from, Indo you have an Indonesian festival, people are wearing Indonesian headdresses. Then you're gonna be bound to have some people that are gonna be sensitive to that and raise red flags and then there'll be some fuss about that. I mean, you've read it in the news with you know, Indian headdresses in the US at Coachella. They, they tend to make a stink about that. Um, so, there's definitely sensitivity, but I mean, in, in the U.S., it's quite a diverse market, and they have a lot of um, ethnic uh, diversity. So I think they're pretty pretty open to that sort of thing, and it's quite rich. I mean, if you look at uh, food culture, uh, travel culture, I think the U.S. are open to something like that, and I I'm, and I, I'm, I would assume that Europe, Europe as well. Um, and the second part, um, I th I think. You know, Thailand, for example, I'll use it's the second most, uh, second largest tourist destination in the world after France. They, they compete um, one or the other, and, and Bali is one of the most des desirable tourist destinations in the world. And the Asia tourist boom is huge. So um, I think those who are looking for something more creative and artsy, there's, there's plenty of uh, content for people to digest. So 
Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of barriers. I think people, the people who are actively seeking this kind of culture are generally open-minded. Yeah, I just wonder, just sort of was thinking out loud on stage as everyone was talking, just how little is done to talk to a European market so that clubbers and festival goers go, I'm not actually going to go to EDC this year, I'm actually going to go to Thailand, I'm actually going to go to Myanmar, I'm going to experience something totally unique and kind of keep the flavour of local but make it global. That seems to me a good place to go. From an AEG perspective, how have you seen things change over the last five years in terms of the Asian market? Have you seen it become less international and more flavoured with its own confident culture? I would say we've seen both, right? Because on the international side, you know, there's, there's more artists coming in, um, you know, there's more more presence, you know, it's more prevalent to see international artists uh, performing, whether that's, you know, on the electronic side or on the live, you know, live performance side, they're coming in more frequently, you know, more of them are coming more frequently to more places, so I think you're seeing more and more, more on the on the international side. Um, but on the local side, obviously, there certainly are, you know, certainly have been a lot of great developments, I'm sure plenty of people here involved in that, to, you know, to, to raise the level of, um, of quality and, and variety, um, you know, I'm not sure, you're asking what, what's, what's, what's happened over the past five years, I think you just see more international and more local, but, um, yeah, I just wondered I if, I, if over the last five years, as we, you know, if you go back to the Indian experience of more and more international artists pummeling their way into bigger and bigger events in India, and then we started to see a response from government in India and taste change in India. And, in, and instead of finding local Indian talent stop exporting back out of India, the market kind of shrunk pretty quickly. Um, and I just wondered if you're seeing something the same or seeing something different. Like I said, I mean, to me, what I see across these markets is, is you know, positive development on both sides. But, you know, you were talking about local heroes. I, I think, you know, it's good to talk about the artists, uh, but it, it makes sense to talk about the promoters as well, the organizers, yeah. the, uh, uh, the sponsors and the, and the venues and say, you know, there needs to be local hustle. You know, there needs to be, um, you know, a leveling up of, of what kind of, you know, facilities are being offered. We've, I'm sure all of us face pretty serious venue challenges. There's great ideas and creative, you know, um, concepts that get developed and then fall short, whether it's for venue challenges, you know, uh, regulatory challenges, um, funding challenges, of course. So um, there really needs to be, you know, not only developing, you know, we don't want to just develop artists and ship them off to, uh, you know, European or, or, or American, you know, markets. We want to find ways to create events and, and experiences, you know, here in Asia that speak to the local audience. And do you work with um, local promoters throughout the, t throughout the Asian territory? Yeah, I mean, we, we ourselves promote in a number of markets and, and we have partners, yeah, pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And Pioneer, aside from developing DJs, do you also now start investing and supporting local promoters and local clubs throughout Asia? Um, in Asia, it's like the culture is quite different. Like China, the like the, the clubs are quite changing. Like some clubs are um, closing, but at the other hand, like countries like India, it's like they're opening uh, really uh, new clubs. Like Indonesia, also I feel. So um, this part, yes, uh, we're grabbing. The, we're trying to grab those informations and what um, support that kind of things get the, what, the information really timely. And um, I think also we want to increase the DJ population is also the key. Those young uh, talents is very important. So that, from that side, yeah, we want to really support on that part. And, and tell me, how, how sensitive do you find international DJs and promoters and brands are to local culture and local custom? Do you, do you have, do, is there friction or are you in enough control to say it's different here, be mindful? There's usually not so much friction. It's, it's pretty easy to be, to be frank. Um, however, there are exceptions to the rule, as I'm sure you know, but you know, if it boils who's, down who's to- Who is it, tell them, tell them. You're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, you know, I, it's so far so good, you know, not too many headaches. 
So do you, do you think that there are Christians turning to you? Do you think there are things that need to be protected? Or do you think actually there's enough strength and confidence in, in all of the local markets in Asia that actually everyone can stand on their own two feet? No, I think we, especially, I'm talking about Indonesia because that's my territory. So we believe this, we have a look, we have a strong enough flavors and culture and diversity in our, within our market that's to sustain. Uh, the international talents helps to build again to build the market bigger because it's maybe the common name. Uh, but then the local market is what's going to make it the local flavor, the local talents, and the local ambience or you know design or experience is what's going to make it unique. Well, you know, it'd be great to see if it, if there was a homegrown product versus uh, a licensed product. Let's say Ultra, for example. If it was a homegrown product and, and it was, you had some incentives or subsidies from tourism boards or cultural committees and things like that so that encourage you to encourage entrepreneurialism, encourage people to preserve culture and for people to support, um, I think that would be a great thing. So that, that would be you know, something that encourages you to, to preserve what you have and also grow that and cultivate that and share that with people, share that with the audience and make and create uh, local motivation to do more of that from a, from a talent standpoint. Uh, because how do you learn? You learn through emulating aspirational admiration. And this is the whole local hero thing. I mean, if you have a Messi in your town, you might want to be a football player. But if you don't have a Messi in your town, you might not want to play football. So um, creating an infrastructure where there's incentives and subsidies to, to encourage you to want to do it is, is something that can... I just want to add, I mean, like, so many festivals around Asia now, you know, every country. Again, having that local flavor, local, you know, production experience, you know, and the local, the local talent itself is what's going to make you different. Otherwise, why would you go to Jakarta or instead of Singapore or you want to go to Bangkok instead of Taipei? You know, it's, it's, that's why it's, it's our job to make, make our product unique. And that's what it needs. And, and do you think that's happening? Do you think that there is enough uniqueness that, it, that you can create a situation where every country has its own flavor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think so. I think you know every. If it, this is the reason why people go to Thailand for the second biggest tourism market in the world. You know, that's why people go to Bali. You know, that's why when we do the produce event in Bali, we make sure okay, it's surrounded by the experience. We don't want to produce it like as if you are in Hong Kong or in a U.S. Right? We want to make sure that hey, you are in Bali. This is Bali. Yeah, there's yeah. so much culture to draw from, but I mean, would you rather go to the Venetian to see Venice in, in, in Vegas, or would you rather go to Venice? So, on your point about subsidies, on your point about local government support, why do you think it's not happening? Are they, is there something terrifying about electronic music well, events, or is it just not connected? Well, I think there's information asymmetry, and there's also lack of information. Um, it's something that a lot of these the, the people who are who are providing these subsidies, it's something they don't understand. So it's a job for the promoters to provide the information, to provide the education um, in order to um, get these people to be aligned with what we're trying to do. That this, you know, we're providing entertainment. And if you look at it, there's actually more incidents in rock and roll concerts and country music concerts than there are in electronic music concerts. Concerts, but because there's lack of information about it, they get sensationalized. So, you know, Ultra in Hong Kong this past week, and one person died, three, three people got injured. Cover of the newspaper, sensationalized. It gives a bad rap to electronic music, sends it back five years. Um, so, you know, someone smokes a cigarette, causes a fire with a, a toxic paint that was trying to copy uh, what Life in Color does. That ruins it for everyone. So, um, you know, providing information that educates. Um, governing bodies on um, what we're trying to do and why is it valuable um, and and also on their end being open-minded to understand that you know we're just another form of entertainment as well so and and removing those stigmas of you know just ha ha having drugs and alcohol uh, because it's pervasive everywhere anyway uh, and Rob you're in the position where you can see across genre so you must be able to look down and go and see some of this f f in reality do you see uh, more issues in electronic music, less the same incidents in terms of things that happen at events, or would you say that, that all live events carry the same level of risk of incident? I mean, negative incidents, accidents yeah. or safety accidents, problems or health safety, problems. safety, drunkenness, I, you know, you know, I, I think injuries. It's, it, I think it's all of our jobs to be, you know, especially attuned to, you know, health and life safety, 
um, and security, which is a really massive issue across our, our industry, which I don't think is the topic of this panel, but uh, it, it ends up being a, an important topic for all of us because, you know, certainly the world uh, has changed a bit um, and there's a lot of serious, you know, threats and, and unfortunately our industry has been targeted. Um, and so across the industry, I'm, you know, I'm seeing uh, a very serious response to those threats um, and, you know, people working absolutely overtime to, yeah. to protect, um, protect the audience, protect the artist, protect the, you know, the integrity and, and, uh, and the reputation of, of, of the industry. So, um, you know, I think it doesn't really matter whether it's electronic or rock or, or country or anything. Anytime you've got, you know, an event going on, you, you want people to behave, you know, in a safe manner and you want to create a safe condition for everybody. But that's a, a hugely important topic. I do, I do think it, the, the cultural aspect touches on the topic of the panel, but especially when you look back at events that happen at things like Further Future, where certain countries have begun to be opposed to electronic music events because of the, co the perceived association with narcotics, the, the association with alcohol, and I'm just, and that's really kind of the point of the question is, do you see do you see a difference or a connection between the number of incidents at an event and the type of music, or is incidents at event genre neutral? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's that, um, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's that directly connected because, you know, you could, you know, as I mentioned before, we, have, we all face, you know, pretty serious regulatory challenges. Um, you know, you have um, concerns about violence in, in rock, you know, music, or you have concerns about uh, other, you know, other issues on hip hop. Um, you know, sometimes it isn't even tied to the event or the genre of music at all. I mean, here we are in, in, you know, in China, and there's unique regulatory, you know, challenges here. Obviously, in, in Southeast Asia, you have different, um, different challenges, different, you know, different issues to face. And I think what's um, what's best is just to figure out what works in each market. So let's, let's look to the future a little bit before we move to questions. So, Takako, what do you think or hope will, will change in terms of the development of local Asian markets over the next five years? So? Well, first, maybe, sorry, let me talk about Japan. Um, like, Japan is like still, maybe I talked about this last year, but still have an image that is not quite it's quite bad actually this culture is uh, when it talks about underground what like the drugs or whatever the news always comes from the club so we want to make it clean the image clean is I think and well for example like utilizing those Olympics that's coming in Tokyo I believe we want to make this image very clean for this not only Japan but those other countries as well is what we're thinking mm. And from your perspective, what do, you, what do you hope or think will happen over the next five years? What's, in, what's important for, for the growth of, of a sort of culturally significant electronic music scene for you? I'd like to see more diversity, really, like in terms of the musical playground. You know, I think it's, there's too much of something that's not really good. And I'm kind of glad of what I see, at least in my market, that a lot of people are moving away from the commercial EDM and they're trying to explore other things which, you know, is an important part of what, we're, what, what we all do. Um, because, you know, if people are interested in other things, we can always bring, you know, that new product or whatever it is that we, we're trying to introduce in the market. How do you balance brand and sponsor involvement and a need for diversity and risk taking? It's tough, especially when it's an international brand, um, because they want to do it their way, because they've done it all over the world, but when it becomes, you know, certain markets like Christian and I, um, it's, you got to kind of meet halfway, you know, but because they want the exposure, obviously they're paying big bucks to get their logo on, you know, that screen, and if it's not on there, it becomes a problem. <laughs> How do you manage that challenge, Christian, of sort of nurturing local and, and providing sort of strength for new talent and sponsors and brands? Lots of patience. No, I think a lot of education also to the both sides, so they understand um, the pro and con, the potential of each side, you know, because you cannot force, you know, a square into a round hole, and that's what they need to know. And it's our job to intermediate 
you know, the both sides of ch challenges or requirements. And what we see, we, we try to see the, f the middle ground, the fair ground, and we understand, okay, you win some, you win some, you lose some, but at the end, everybody's happy. So that's our job. And how do you th see things developing for you over the next five years? I think the potential is, is, is uh, to grow is always there. Uh, I, see, I see opportunities in the market, especially in Indonesia. Uh, but of course, it needs, to be done, it needs to be done carefully because, again, it's a sensitive market. Uh, all the promoters, not only, are, not only us, have to be responsible because even though we do well, if somebody else doesn't do well, it can ruin the market, you know. So, but then we have high hopes for the next five years. And Jason, your own view on, on how things will develop over the next five years and specifically about bringing out that kind of local flavor into the scene? Well, from a promoter's standpoint, we need to dig deep and embrace our culture, whatever Southeast Asia city you come from, uh, because there's so much to draw from, and I've said that over and over again in this, in this panel. Uh, the other thing is reaching out to your neighbors for, for support in ticket sales, in talent, because there's so much to draw from. And it's, gonna, and it's gonna be growing exponentially over time. And I think over this course of this week, you'll, you're gonna see the data and it, it, proves, uh, it proves that. And then um, from a brand standpoint, if you look at it, brands wanna be associated with lifestyle. They wanna be associated with experiences. So as good promoters, we actually have a lot of leverage now. Um, we don't have to whore ourselves out to generic brands that just want to give you free shit you know, or like, hey, let me just put my logo everywhere. For Wonderfruit, we have a no logo on premise policy. Uh, it has to be contextual. It has to match our ethos, our DNA. Um, what are you about? What are we about? Do, are we aligned? If we are, then we do think good things together. You know, what problems am I trying to solve? What problems are you trying to solve? Can we meet in the middle? For example, this year we're working with Air Asia. You know, we have a lot of content. We have 50 speakers. We have chefs, cooks, DJs, live acts across the board, and um, Air Asia is, is a regional discount airline, so they're providing airline, but providing flights for our speakers um, and for the talent, and local talent, not the superstar talent. So we, we book, um, we make sure that we book at least one act from every city in, in every country in Asia, to try our best to at least, if not 15, 20. Um, and they help us fly in, and we meet their regional image. Um, Tony Fernandez himself, the CEO, is giving a talk at the event, and, he's, and his one condition was to DJ at the festival as well. So to me, that's like a match made in heaven, and he doesn't get like brand presence, but him himself is, is good enough. So I think that's a good example for that. But uh, I think it should be contextual. For example, you know, if you're providing, if you're Samsung and you're providing a charging station, that adds value to people, right? Um, and it's functional. But just to have... Um, you know, a, a Colgate sign, and no one's brushing their teeth on the festival, then what's the point? Random, but good point. Um, and look, closing words from you, Rob, what, when AEG looks at the Asian market broadly and specifically, where do you see the next five years? Where will you bet your chips? I think for, you know, for the Asian markets, I think you're really gonna see an emergence of uh, you know, domestic superstars. And I think they're not, obviously there are plenty of them now, but I think you're gonna see them in other genres, particularly in electronic music, particularly in hip hop, you know, or, or other categories um, where they haven't traditionally been as, as accepted in mainstream. Um, so I think, you know, definitely in the, I mean, it's already happening now, we're seeing the steps of it, but definitely over the next five years, you'll see, you know, big acts emerging with large domestic followings and therefore they'll get regional and international followings. Um, breaking out, you know, in, in EDM or, or hip hop or, or rock or punk or whatever it is, but uh, it just, you know, it won't continue to be just, you know, mainstream pop, um, and that's exciting. Um, and I think that gives way to, you know, new events and new, new formats. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Um, we've got time for questions, so uh, and we've got microphones, so we can run around and help you. Has anyone got any questions for anyone on the panel? from any aspect that we've spoken about? Or have we closed it all off again brilliantly? There must be some questions. Who, who wants to see DJ Tony Fernandez? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go in. Anyone? Okay. No, Charlie, you saved me. Arshid, what are the challenges that you get in Myanmar? The challenges that you get in Myanmar? 
in Myanmar the challenges? Um, mainly, um, I think the understanding of the local government. Uh, when we went in three years ago, it was pulling teeth. Um, but we, but after the first one, it, I think things got a little easier. Um, I mean, in terms of permits, it's quite you know, it's quite accessible. Everything's all. It's a lot easier than Thailand, if you want me to answer your question. But um, I think that um, overall Myanmar is going to develop quite well in terms of the, the whole landscape. But in terms of working there, the only problem I see is really, you know, having to get the production and you know, a, lot the, a lot of the equipment over the border from Thailand. That's a major factor at times. But besides that, there's really not a major, any major issues. Thank you. Anyone else? Cool. Okay. Listen, thank you very much, everybody. And thank, thank you very you. much to the audience. Cheers.